Today, Iceland leads the way on Macro Pro. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post, covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Moody's reports that Iceland has restored the counter-cyclical buffer and has introduced debt service caps in mortgages, which they see as a credit positive for banks. On the 29th of September, the Central Bank of Iceland announced its intention to restore the counter capital buffer, the CCYB, to 2% from 0%, with the increase taking effect in 12 months. The central bank also announced new rules on retail mortgages, capping the debt service to income ratio for the first time. Both measures, they say, are credit positive for Icelandic banks because they will mitigate the risks associated with rapidly rising asset prices and increasing household debt. Additionally, the measures will support the bank's asset quality and reinforce high levels of capital, which protect bank creditors from losses. Iceland's central bank decreased its counter cyclical buffer to 0% in March 2020 to provide banks with greater flexibility to continue supporting lending to creditworthy businesses and households during the coronavirus pandemic. The decision to restore the counter cyclical buffer to its pre-pandemic level reflects the recovery of the Icelandic economy, which is expected to grow by about 3.4% in 2021, following a contraction of 6.6% in 2020. And they think it will return to its pre-pandemic growth levels of 5% in 2022. Supporting the economy's rebound is the reopening of the economy and an increase in tourism as a result of Iceland's 80% vaccination rate. Restating the capital buffer also signals a reduction in economic risks and reinforces the buffers that banks must hold against unexpected losses. But the introduction of tighter underwriting standards indicates that tail risks from asset appreciation persists. Icelandic banks benefit from strong capital metrics, supported by internal capital generation derived from increased lending activity, and they expect that to remain intact despite the higher capital buffer requirements. Although banks have 12 months to comply with the increased requirements, all Icelandic banks actually currently meet them now. The central bank also introduced a debt servicing to income ratio cap of 35% for new mortgages issued after the 1st of December 2021, and they capped the DSTI ratio for first-time buyers at 40%. Those rules follow a lowering of the maximum loan-to-value ratio to 80% from 85% in June 2021, and they expect the DSTI ratio caps to support Icelandic households' debt service resilience and contain house price appreciation, strengthening Icelandic banks' asset quality. Mortgages account for almost 50% of banks' lending operations. House prices in the greater Retrovic area have increased this year by 11.6% in real terms to reach record highs, following a 4% rise in 2020. Although household indebtedness, as measured by household debt to disposal income, has decreased over the past 10 years and is at 161%, that's below the Nordic average of 204%, and loan-to-value ratios have risen over the past 18 months. And furthermore, Icelandic households have taken advantage of all-time low interest rates to swap their fixed-rate inflation-linked loans with non-index variable loans, increasing their sensitivity to interest rate charges. Non-index variable rate mortgages constitute 32.9% of all mortgages in August 21, up from 18.5% in January 2020. Still, Icelandic households have performed well during the pandemic, frozen loans or loans that are not paid down with contractual instalments and can accrue interest peaked at 2.27% in February 2021 versus 0.91% at the end of 2019. That number since recovered to 1.62% as at the end of August 21 because of support measures for, for pandemic affected industry. And if that wasn't enough, yesterday the Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank of Iceland decided to raise the bank's interest rates by 0.25 percentage points. The bank's key interest rate, the rate on seven-day term deposits, is now set at 1.5%.
And they said, according to preliminary national account figures, GDP growth has slightly weakened in the first half of 2021 than was forecast in the August monetary bulletin. Growth in domestic demand was well in line with the bank's forecasts, but indicators imply a continued strong domestic economic recovery in the third quarter and the GDP growth outlook for 2021 as a whole is broadly unchanged, they said. Inflation rose to 4.4% in September and the contribution from the housing component continued to increase and housing accounted for a large share of headline inflation in September. Underlying inflation continued to ease, however, although it remained significant. On the other hand, the impact of temporary supply chain disruptions, which have pushed manufacturing and distribution costs upward all over the world, could persist longer than previously anticipated. Although underlying inflation is declining, they said, there is cause for concern in that inflation expectations appear to have begun rising again. It's too soon, they said, to say whether they will become less firmly anchored in the inflation target ahead. The MPC will apply the tools at its disposal to ensure that inflation eases back to the target within an acceptable time frame. So as well as lifting interest rates, note how in Iceland the costs of housing are much more directly plugged into the CPI. So in so many ways it seems to me that Iceland has things right when it comes to thinking about monetary policy. Now, it's worth looking at Iceland in some detail because you can see there that they are much more sensitised to the risks in the property sector compared with Australia. Overall mortgage exposure at the banks is lower and they are imposing much stronger debt-to-income ratio and loan-to-value ratio restrictions compared with what we're doing here in Australia. They know something we don't, I think, and that is that the risks in the property sector because of high debt are huge and they're trying to cut them off at the pass. Of course, here in Australia, we don't care about that. We just go on lending quite freely and APRA's recent intervention is, as I said the other day, just a wet lettuce. So worth looking at what's happening abroad because it does tell us what should be happening here. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.